Not everybody stood. I'm totally aware of that. I'm at peace with it. I understand. So let me tell those who are here against me in advance, you will have a hard job because I'm actually nice. So all the de demonization of me may actually prove unwarranted and then you will enter cognitive dissonance. Why did I believe such things about a decent man, even if we don't agree on issues? So what I want to do at the very outset, and thank you, Isabel, who's just terrific, I, I want to tell you a story. You can look it up. It's on the internet. And it's not a matter of trust because the actual original documents are there. When I spoke at the University of California at Santa Barbara many years, not many, about five years ago, and I spoke about Islam. So I was called a bigot and an Islamophobe and, and all the, you know, the six herbs, sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, racist, and bigoted. So I, I, that, that's the usual. So the guy who wrote the column saying, how could UCSB invite such a bigot to our campus? So what I did was I invited him onto my national radio show with millions of listeners across the country. And he was shocked because they don't normally do that. We do. Just so one of the many, many differences between left and right is the right wants to hear the left. The left will never hear us for good reason. We may persuade them otherwise. And that is very discomforting. We want to hear you. Not yelling, not interrupting, but we will reserve, in this case, question and answer. You come first if you disagree with me. Anyway, he was shocked. I'm gonna, not only, not only am I going to hear him, I'm going to give him a forum of millions of people to say why I am a bigot. So he came onto the show, to his credit, I, I give him the credit, and we talked, and I've never yelled at anybody in 35 years of radio, and I didn't yell at him. And the reason I don't yell is, A, it's much more effective not to yell, and secondly, I want people who don't agree with me to feel okay about coming on. Anyway, he came on. So as a result of that, he came to the speech at UCSB. Then he wrote another column, and that's why I say you can look it up. The column is still on the internet. The next column was, I apologize to Mr. Prager. That's pretty powerful. He actually heard me and realized, gee, this guy's really not a bigot, homophobe, xenophobe, and all the other phobes that are used. By the way, why are all those labels used? The labels are used so that one doesn't have to interact with ideas. That is the entire purpose. We can dismiss you without ever arguing with you. That's the only purpose of it. None of them are valid, but, the, but if you are indeed all of those things, why debate you? I, would I debate a Ku Klux Klanner? What is there to debate about? If you truly believe whites are superior to blacks, we don't, there's nothing to debate about. You're so perverse that it's like telling me two and two is six. I'm not going to debate someone who says two and two is six. So that is the understanding of what is done when we who are normative conservative are labeled all of these things so as not to deal with what we have to say. But I will deal with what they did have to say. So I will read to you from the Rocky Mountain Collegian. Several current and former Colorado State University students went to the floor of the student government Senate Wednesday, Wednesday night to express their displeasure at the use of student fees to bring Dennis Prager to campus October 29th, tonight. Luce Stone, a junior anthropology major, who by the way, like the, the I, don't, I don't know, by the way, this is not meant in any way to be sarcastic. I wish I did, I looked up pictures, I could find nothing. I don't know if Luce is male or female or non-gendered. Uh, so I can't know what to say he or she, but I can tell you that I, we did twice invite Lou Stone onto my radio show. I just, for the record, I want you to know that. A junior anthropology major and employee at the Women and Gender Advocacy Center was the first to speak about Prager's upcoming visit. Stone, concerned with various views of Prager on the LGBTQ community, Islam, and women's issues, questioned whether bringing someone who has those views should be brought to campus. Quote, free speech and debate are key parts of college campuses, but, I always love a but, after 
students who say, oh, I'm for free speech, but, but, and then add, for example, not for hate speech. So here is something you need to know. Nobody has a problem, no one, with free speech for love speech. The whole point of free speech is that it allows what you consider to be hate speech. Otherwise, there is no free speech. If you are the determiner of all that is to be considered hate speech, you are, you are a self-appointed guardian of everyone's ears. You are frightening, not the people who you are banning. You are the frightening person. You are acting in a way... When I was young, there was a, uh, I don't remember the year, I assume it was in the 1970s, so I was, I was your, your age essentially, and I, I, was, I was a graduate student at Columbia University in New York, where I grew up, and uh, there was a march by Nazis, real live Nazis, in Skokie, Illinois. Skokie, Illinois is outside of Chicago, and the reason they chose Skokie is because they're particularly cruel. These not, all Nazis are cruel by definition, but they had an agenda of cruelty. Skokie was where Holocaust survivors lived. Jewish Holocaust survivors, people who had had their, their families wiped out in gas chambers and, and machine gun squads, that's, a lot of them lived in Skokie. So they went to Skokie to rub their faces in the swastika. The ACLU and the New York Times and Jewish groups defended their right to march. That's real hate speech. That's the real deal. But we knew that in America, that is the value. You let the worst people, not just people you differ with, the worst people can speak publicly. They cannot be shut down. So we have come a long way. The ACLU today would not defend, uh, I suspect, Nazis' right to speak. The ACLU has morphed from a civil liberties organization to another left-wing organization. It's a tragedy, but it is a, it is a, uh, if watch my video on the differences between liberalism and leftism, and you will see what I am referring to. Anyway, we continue. Free speech and debate are key parts of college campuses, Stone, sa Stone said. But do we want to host a speaker that actively wishes harm toward people of marginalized identity? So I read this, by the way, here's, here's the blessing. I don't care personally. To say, to say this has no effect on me, all of these things, is to understate the case. Uh, and by the way, just a, a, a wonderful word of advice, because I'm gonna give you a lot of wonderful words of advice uh, tonight uh, from someone considerably older than you. I adopted a wonderful attitude in the beginning of my public career, which started oddly enough at the age of 21. And I did this, and I said to myself, I cannot let praise go to my head, and I cannot let insults go to my heart. That is the way everyone, all of you, should adopt life. Don't let insults go to your heart, because if one goes to one, the other will go to the other. If you let praise go to your head, you will let insults go to your heart. So it was, it was a terrific protective measure. It protected my ego from getting too big, and it protected my heart from getting too hurt. So it doesn't mean a damn thing to me. The reason this is troubling is that they are lying about me. And lies are not good things. The road to Auschwitz was paved with lies. So I loathe lies. I loathe them. I don't loathe the people who tell them as much as I loathe the lies because the people who tell them don't know they're lying, which is very scary. I don't know which is scarier, those who lie knowing they're lying or those who think that they're telling the truth. But here it is. So I actively wish harm towards people of marginalized identities. I mean, I could make, I could make fun of this. I, you know, just today I woke up and I said to my wife, how can I hurt people of marginalized identity today? <laughs> I, just another opportunity to to actively hurt people of marginalized identity. And she said, yeah, you're right. Another great day in our life. <laughs> so, and then, then Stone asked, is engaging in debate worth risking the safety and well-being of our queer Muslim and female students? Is the safety of, uh, of queer Muslim and female students jeopardized by my appearance? That's, that's beyond belief. 
the safety? Someone will get hurt? Some queer Muslim or, or female student will be hurt because of, of what I spoke about? My life, as corny as it sounds, has been dedicated to goodness. The thing I most care about is people treat each other good. That everything else to me is of secondary concern. So this is, it's like living in a world of absurdity. By the way, let's take one, one at a time, the Muslim students, okay. So I, I was invited to debate the head of the Muslim Public Affairs Committee at a university, a graduate university in, uh, in Southern California. So th th you have to understand, these are the protectors of American Muslims. There's one of the biggest Muslim American organizations, Mobile, Muslim Public Affairs Committee. Why would they agree to debate me if I endanger Muslims? Uh, so the people who wrote this, or this person, they are more protective of Muslims than Muslims are. Muslims invite me to speak. I'm invited to mosques. How is that possible? And in the debate, I said to my, my, my Muslim adversary that the topic was, does Islam need a reformation? I said yes, he said no. Fine, it's a totally fair debate. I even said, in my opinion, the historical record is not that Islam has been a religion of peace. And he said, well, I don't agree. He didn't, and we went to dinner afterwards. <laughs> Do you understand? We went to dinner after I said what I just told you. Somehow he didn't feel, he didn't even bring a food taster with him. I just want you to know that. He somehow felt he would survive the dinner. The absurdities of this, it's, it's, it doesn't bother me. Be, be, aside from it, it's the absurdity, it is a level of sickness. What else here? Queer. Okay, queer. So that includes gays. So just for the record, I and my wife are godparents to a gay couple's two children. Is that exactly in danger, uh, gays? What exactly in my life has endangered gays? I am opposed to same-sex marriage. That is correct. I'm a religious Jew. I take the Bible as my guide. I believe that God ordained a world in which the only marriage is ultimately between a man and a woman. That is my belief. That's it. You can, you can disagree. You can hate it. That has been the definition of marriage all through history in every civilization. We changed it, and that's it. So we changed it. Dave Rubin, was that the video you saw? Because I couldn't hear anything back there. So Dave Rubin is gay. Why would a gay guy married to a man make a video for Prager University if I endanger queers, if I endanger gays? Why would I have a married gay man make a video for Prager University if I were anti-gay? That would be the ultimate idiocy. I am giving the imprimatur of Prager University to not just a gay man, a gay man married to a gay man, and we go to his home for dinner. <laughs> isn't that amazing? No, it isn't amazing. It is only amazing to the sick people who charge me with these things, and it is sickness. It's moral and psychological sickness. There is no truth to it. It is pure lie. What's the next one? Okay, the next one was female. Oh, God, I endanger female students. <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. I have, I have a thought, and I'll come to that in a moment. But I, but I want to tell you something about this endangered female student thing in general that the university, and boy, to get me to, to defend universities takes a big, tall order. But uh, the university is charged with being a, uh, a rape culture. Now, here's an example of where I don't believe they believe their lies. And I'll tell you why. Why would any female attend a, a rape culture college? Are they masochists? Do they want to be hurt? Why would any parent of a daughter anyone in America send their daughter to a rape culture. They don't believe their lies. That's proof. There is no one here whose parent, no, no woman in this group, whose parent would send their daughter to a rape culture. They know the left is lying because the left lies so much, people are used to it. So it, it bounces off walls. It's like an echo chamber. They believe their lies, but they don't act on their lies because they attend college. 
If you think you have a one in five chance of being raped, why on God's earth would you show up there? There's something wrong with you. The parents know it's a lie, the universities know it's a lie, and the students know it's a lie. But it's repeated so much that, as Goebbels said, a lie, if you repeat it enough, people believe it, even if they don't act on it. But here's the charge against me. Because I, oh, and it even says it here, I think it's in the article, I'm coming to the end of it. So let's see, Alex Scott, Jr. Natural Resources Management, also spoke about his disappointment in bringing Prager, that's me, to campus. <laughs> Having ASCSU splash their logo across Dennis Prager's advertisements for his speech and his advertisements for his ideas is beyond the pale. Beyond the pale, I mean, think about that. Why would, why would bringing a really terrible person be? If I'm beyond the pale, are they beyond two pales? Are they three beyonds? It's amazing. <laughs> To ask these women who have survived sexual assault, who now have this trauma as part of this lived experience, to walk to class knowing that their money is being spent to bring a man who believes that women in marriages should never deny their husbands sex, that we should ignore sexual assault victims, I don't even know what that's, oh, oh I know what that's from, now you do, it's from the Kavanaugh hearing, that we should ban homosexuality because it makes culture great is beyond the pale. So I'll take all three. Okay, the first one. So let me tell you a very good lesson about how to read articles. When people uh, write an article and they quote someone, if there are no quote marks and the source is the person themselves, not something written about them, the odds are the writer made it up, which is exactly here. So just for the record, I have never in my life said, written, implied, or hinted that women in marriages should never deny their husband sex. I'll tell you what I did write, because uh, I'm proud of what I wrote, and you have no idea how many women and men have thanked me for better marriages. So I wrote, and it's, it's on the internet, it's, I write a column every week, I have for about 20 years, and I wrote about, I don't remember the title, but it was about, um, it was about, when, oh yes, it was tied, yes I think I do, when women are not in the mood, or when wives are not in the mood, one of the two, I, I don't remember. So here is what I wrote. And I, I have some basis because I have done for years a male-female hour on my radio show. Unbelievably honest talk about men and women. People call in from all over the country, in, in fact from the world, because it's on the internet. And we talk about really open talk about the marriage. And as I say every time, it's Wednesday, the second hour of my show, as I say every time it opens, I'm not a woman fan and I'm not a man fan. There are disgusting men and disgusting women and wonderful men and wonderful women. I don't root for either sex. I wrote a root for the sexes to get along better. That is the purpose of the male-female hour. So I, I realized, talking to so many people and getting so many emails, that uh, in case you didn't know because you're in college and you don't learn reality, but uh, in reality, there really is, for most marriages, in most marriages, there is a disparate uh, sexual impulse in men and women. Men, mo this is a generalization. Let me explain what generalization means. It doesn't mean always or all. It means usually, okay? And it's important for those covering this from the school paper. So. Generally speaking, men want sex more often than women do. Like 24-7. <laughs> okay? That's the general rule. Men are animals. Women are right when they say men are animals. That is correct. And I'm one of them. I am a man. Men are animals. Therefore, I am an animal. I understand. It's Aristotelian logic. Okay, fair enough. Generally speaking, women need to be in the mood. That's true. So what I wrote was, if you love your husband, and he is a really good man, you might want to consider, if you could shut your phones off, that would be great, thanks. It's so rude, it's really so rude. Oh, it's, okay, if it's intentional, okay, it's a profound protest, it's profound. <laughs> they let their phone ring. Right. 
Okay. So what I wrote, what I wrote was, if you, lo- and it, it was a big F. If you love your husband, if he's a good man, don't let mood be the only thing that determines whether you have sex with him. That's it. That's it. That, w- that was what I wrote because it means so much to him that for most men it is one of the mo- one of the chief ways you are expressing how much you love him. And if he is if he is uh, if he is faithful, he can't have sex anywhere else. So, give it a try. That's it. That was it. By the way, it is really, I wish I could video the number of couples who, 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 who come to speeches or even see me at airports. And it's the couple, a husband and wife, and they say, just want you to know, I want to thank you for your male-female hour. It's really made a difference in our marriage. And I, I look at the guy, I swear to you, every time this happens, and I go, sir, you owe me. <laughs> And he goes, I sure do. (laughs) And she goes, he sure does. (laughs) For that, I have been uh, just, uh, for that I am accused of being anti-female and uh, pro-marital rape. Okay, just so I wanted you to know the context. You could read the article. You'll see if what I said to you was a fair summary. This is what, this is what, all of you females, this is what's endangering your presence by my, 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 you, by my being here. Such horrific views. I have a theory, by the way, as to why people say these things. It's a, it's a, it's a very troubling uh, theory, but I'll give it to you in a moment. Oh, and finally, we should ban homosexuality because it makes culture great. So this is all written, uh, quoting uh, some student here. Ban homosexuality. I will give $10,000 to any human rights group if you find where I say we should ban homosexuality. It's a pure lie. It's a 100% lie. First of all, how do you ban homosexuality? I mean, aside from everything else, what are we going to have patrols in people's homes? I mean, what what are we going to do? Gay patrols? I mean, it's so absurd. Why would I be the godfather of the parents of a gay couple if I, if I wanted to ban, if I wanted to legally ban it? What I did write in a, in a 20,000 word essay on homosexuality and, and Judaism and civilization is that uh, the, the Bible did something remarkable. In all ancient societies, all, not most, all, homosexuality was fine. And so you had vast amount of sexual energy in men toward boys, not pre-adolescent, but 15, 16, 17 year old hunks of male, male, or I mean, men are attracted to youth, whether it's male or female, just the way men are made. And so in Greece, for example, if you could afford it, you had a boy or a young man and your wife was for making babies. The Bible came along and said, no, confine your sex, your sexuality to marriage. Make the marital bed an erotic place. It's not just for making babies, it's for having sex. That's what was at, I mean, I'm summarizing 20,000 words. That's what I wrote. It has nothing to do with banning homosexuality. This is the first time I ever heard that. So the the guy literally made it up. So that's, that is, that is the whole, that is the stuff that I am accused of. And uh, in a nutshell, what I actually said. So I just wanted you to know. What do I want to do otherwise with you this evening? I, I, because I take this beyond belief seriously. There are so many of you here, over a thousand of you. Most of you were students. And so I think, I'll, obviously through PragerU and, and writings, I have a chance to talk to you, but nothing, is, nothing in the world is like live. So what can I do? I'll do with some political, but I want to do everything. I care about all of life. That's why I have a male-female hour. That's why I conduct orchestras. I love music. So I love life. And I, I've written a book on happiness, and I talk, I've talked around the world on happiness. I care about your well-being, as corny as it sounds. So I want to offer you some thoughts on life that you probably will not have heard at the, well, almost definitely not have heard at the university and may not have heard anywhere. Number one is, is perhaps the most important, 
or tied for first with other things. You, you can't advance in understanding life if you don't know that people are not basically good. If you want goodness to prevail on earth, you have to know the raw material you're working with. Human nature is not particularly good. The, when I, it's, on, it's on YouTube, you can watch. When I spoke at Berkeley, they said, well, instead of giving a talk, would you debate leftist students? I said, that would be a joy. I would love to. So they took two of their best, and they were the, among their best. It was clear. You could watch it. And I debated two left-wing students at Berkeley. And at the very end, oh, by the way, you may not know this, I have a motto on my radio show, and it is a wonderful motto to adopt in life. In fact, I tell married, married couples to adopt it. It'll prevent a lot of arguments. My motto on my show is I prefer clarity to agreement. So that I'm not, I'm, instead of, I don't want to persuade you, I just want to clarify where it is we differ. So that's what I did with the Berkeley leftists. I clarified where they on the left and I on the right differed. My last question to them was, do you believe people are basically good? Both said yes. And I knew they'd say yes. If they didn't, they wouldn't be on the left. It is one of the myths that makes leftism, which has no bearing with reality, uh, possible. And I said to them, and this is key, you know why you believe people are basically good? because you live in America, where people are basically good. I have been to 130 countries and all 50 states. It's a lot of travel. I've been abroad every single year since I was 20 years old. I've taken travel very seriously. I love a lot of countries. I love a lot of different people. There are disgusting Americans and there are beautiful people everywhere in the world. However, well, let me put it in the words of a French woman in Nice. I was at a conference in Nice, France a few years ago, broadcast my radio show from there. And at dinner at a very fancy restaurant, this young woman was our waitress. And I, uh, I started speaking in French. And then she responded in English, and it was clear her English was superior to my French, so I immediately reverted to English. <laughs> I only speak foreign languages to people whom I speak their language better than they speak mine. I, I, it's just, it's a practical consideration. So then I said to her, where did you learn your English? She said, oh, I spent two years in the United States. I said, oh, great. So then I said, listen, I have a question. I do a radio show in America, so I ask a lot of questions. I don't care, I promise you, I don't care what your answer is. So you can't, it won't be, you won't hurt my feelings, whatever you say. But I would like to, you to tell me what is the biggest single difference between French people and Americans? And she said, Americans are nicer. Americans are friendlier. And that was quite remarkable for a French person to say, and she's certainly not anti-French, nor am I. But she's right. Americans are about as friendly a people. I mean, there are others. I think Filipinos are super friendly. I mean, there are, there are people around the world. But Americans are, are friendly. And then I, by the way, just, this is of no interest to any of you but me. So nevertheless, I'll still say it. <laughs> she, 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 I said, where did you spend your two years? She said, Tampa, Florida. And that blew my mind because I have said on my radio show maybe a dozen times, I think Tampa is the friendliest place in the United States. So it was sort of skewed in, in the direction of America. I mean, had she spent her time in Manhattan, I'm not sure she would have said what she said. And I come from New York. So I just, I, you know, it, 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 it's somewhat dependent as well where in America. But nevertheless, that's what I said to these two Berkeley students. I, I said, you think people are basically good because you're naive. You don't know how much evil there is in the world, although all you have to do is read about it. I don't know how you read about the Holocaust or slavery and still think people are basically good. I don't get it. I mean, I don't know, it, it, it blows my mind. It is such a naive belief. And it's not a Jewish belief. It's not a Christian belief. Uh, when, I was, when I was five, I knew people weren't basically good because I studied the Bible in a Jewish school. 
And God said the will of man's heart is towards evil from his youth. I knew people weren't basically good. And I learned another thing, which is a massively important thing for you to know. I, I always tell people, they say, What's the, what did you learn in religious school that you don't learn in secular school? And I said, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned in religious school that the biggest problem in Dennis Prager's life is Dennis Prager. In secular school, you learn the biggest problem in your life is America. Big difference. Sexism, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, the capitalism. No. You are a much happier and kinder human being if you believe you are the biggest problem in your life and not America. That's a big one. That's a really, really big one. You have to work on yourself. The most important question a society can ask is how do you make good people? Because the raw material ain't that good. That's why, how many times did your parents say to you, say thank you? A hundred thousand? A quarter of a million? If you were basically good, once would have worked. Oh, whenever someone does something nice to me, I'll say thank you. I'll be a grateful human being. But it doesn't work. Say thank you. Say please. Say thank you. Say please. Share your cookies. You cannot have 22 cookies while they have zero. That's not right. Of course you have to learn. Goodness is in us. Otherwise there would be no good people. But goodness is like gold. It has to be mined. Badness is, doesn't have to be mined. It's natural. Next. My favorite message of all, how you feel does not matter at all. <laughs> the left is rooted on feelings. Gee, I feel, I feel this, I feel that, I feel that. So here is something, when you're ready to get mature, you learn. There are about 7 billion people in the world. The following care about your feelings. Your therapist and your mother. The other 7 billion do not give a damn about your feelings. They only care about your behavior. <laughs> behavior is everything. Feelings aren't. Feelings are important because that's what distinguishes us from artificial intelligence. I agree. But it doesn't matter how you feel, it matters how you act. That is the reason, why do people prefer Marxism, socialism, communism to capitalism? Because they say, well, capitalism is rooted in greed, socialism is rooted in altruism. Yes, but capitalism has been infinitely more altruistic. Capitalism has lifted people from poverty. It's the only economic system that has ever lifted people from poverty. Socialism spends the money that capitalism creates. So it doesn't do any good at all. No one, no one, no one, no one has ever argued socialism takes people out of poverty. Socialism spends the money that capitalism is made to take people out of poverty. Without capitalism, we would all be impoverished. That is the only difference between the modern rich age and all of history where everybody but the elite were, were poor. Capitalism was created in the 19th century and that is the difference. But people who are preoccupied with feelings say, yeah, but people who want to make uh, profit, they're the ones who, who believe in capitalism. I, it's like I just saw an ad against, um, against uh, uh, profit and medicine. People, a guy called me up in fact, I called my show up, come on Dennis, you think it's good for people to make a profit from people being sick? I said, well that's not the way I read it. They're making a profit from making people healthy. And yes, I love that. <laughs> I want people to get very rich conquering cancer. That's exactly what I want. The more people conquer disease, get money, the better it is. May all doctors be wealthy. That's a wonderful thing. And I'm not a doctor, I'm not even a doctor fan. 
But the fact is, that's the people whom I want to be rewarded. Shortstops get $10 million. Doctors don't. Shortstops don't conquer disease. I'm not against shortstops making $10 million. Okay, I just want to make that clear. I'm for a free society, so therefore, shortstops will make more than doctors and nurses and teachers and other sweet people. But nevertheless, if we could reward people who heal us, isn't that good? Won't we get better people? If we get better shortstops for a lot of money, won't we get better doctors for a lot of money? Doesn't that make sense? Does anybody play shortstop out of idealism? <laughs> You get paid. Yes, it is good to reward good. I like that idea. Why is that a bad idea? Back to the notion of people judging feelings. It doesn't matter. That is the most important thing in raising children. You feel, you feel, you feel, fine. How you act, is it goes in both directions. So if you can have the worst thoughts, the worst thoughts, if they don't translate into action, it doesn't matter. If thoughts alone get you to hell, I have a reservation. I have a special spot in hell. But I, but I don't believe that. I believe God judges us by what we do. The Ten Commandments are about deeds. The only commandment that has anything to do with thought is the tenth, do not covet. But covet is a, a very special, unique thing. It doesn't mean don't be envious. It doesn't mean don't be jealous. It doesn't mean don't want. It doesn't mean don't desire. It doesn't mean don't lust. Covet means I want to take what belongs to you from you. That's a bad thought. That's a bad one because it will lead to evil. But most of the time, it leads to nothing. How you act. Same with, by the way, I meant well. Meant well? Who doesn't mean well? Seriously, <clears throat> what communists didn't mean well as they sent the 40 million people to the Gulag Archipelago? You know, the communists in China meant well, and 80 million people lost their lives. I believe, frankly, as a Jew, I will tell you this. I believe a lot of Nazis meant well. We're going to save Germany against the Jewish scourge because they saw all this propaganda about how Jews are vermin. Very few people mean ill. Most people who do disgusting things mean well. Yes, just know that. You know who have the highest self-esteem, which brings me to a related issue? Next lesson, self-control is infinitely more important than self-esteem. Another left-wing idiocy was the self-esteem movement. You know who has the highest self-esteem in America? Okay, I got a Q&A sign. You know who has the highest self-esteem in America? Murderers. Roy Baumeister, major criminologist, Case Western Reserve, University of Florida psychologist. They think the highest of themselves. By the way, they have to. You know how well you have to think of yourself to take somebody else's life? I am more important than you. I can take your life. I, want, I have a project for every one of you, whatever age you are. I want you to ask the two most kind and fine adults you know the following question. Did you have high self-esteem when you were a kid? I know the answer in advance. No. When my kids got uh, trophies for losing, I, I, was on, I was beside myself. I said to my son, David, Dave, your team came in last. Why do you have a trophy? <laughs> and he said, for playing. I said, F for playing? Like, for breathing? We get trophies for breathing, for sitting, for moving, for showing up. It was a terrible movement. But for those who value how you feel more than how you act, let me tell you the only self-esteem that works is earned self-esteem. Finally. So finally, let me see what time it is. Okay, we, yeah, okay, we're good. Let me, so let me make a final point. Oh God, I have so many final points. It's a problem. <laughs> it's, uh, okay, a final point. I do an hour, I've, my, I've done an hour on happiness every Friday. It's very popular. It's the most popular hour of my 15 hours of radio. The first thing people tell me is I love your happiness hour. It's 99% non-political. If you listen, you would not know I'm a conservative or I'm a liberal, you would not know. 
because I just talking about happiness. And I wrote a book on happiness, which is still a, a good, if not bestseller. And uh, I, I, I want to tell you, I, I didn't realize till way into it, it really does have political overtones. Why in every poll uh, do, we, do we find that the, for every poll, the Gallup poll, Pew Research, not my, I don't do a poll, so it's not my notion. People on the right, conservatives are happier than liberals, and the further left you get, the less happy the people are. So is it that leftism makes you unhappy, or you're unhappy and therefore you embrace leftism? I think it's a little of both. I, there are very few happy leftists. Okay, that's the truth. And I'm a big fan of happiness. And then I didn't realize that, you know, the happiest, Women tend to vote conservative. The happiest blacks tend to vote conservative. The happiest Hispanics tend to vote conservative. The happiest whites tend to vote conservative. It's just a fact. It's, I didn't make this up. It's just a fact. Why? So you have a choice in life. Everyone has a tough life. Everyone. That is the nature of life. Okay? So you have two choices. You could say, life is tough, and I will conquer this toughness and I will prevail with happiness anyway, or, in America at least, I can blame it on America. <laughs> the reason I'm unhappy and I'm a woman is because of sexism and misogyny. The reason I'm unhappy and a black is because of racism. The reason I'm unhappy and I'm a Hispanic is because of xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera. The only men who have no excuse about being unhappy are white, heterosexual, Christian males. And by the way, that's the group that commits the most suicide they have nobody to blame. <laughs> but it, the fact is that the, you, you are, if you do blame, you are an unhappy person. I have a chapter in my book, it's not political. It's called Happiness is a Serious Problem. I'm not trying to sell you a book, I'm just telling you what it's called. And in it is a chapter on seeing yourself as a victim. It's guaranteed to make you unhappy. No one in the world who sees themselves primarily as a victim is a happy person. What the left has done, and this is my, my, one of my biggest indictments of the left, not liberals, liberals are different from leftists. I have a whole video on that. My indict, biggest indictment of the left is that they have increased human unhappiness. That is really what they have done. You're a woman, you are a victim of men, you're black, you're a victim of whites, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're a victim. That's what this whole thing was about. I mean, to say, uh, my coming here will endanger all these people, is that pathetic? It's just pathetic to say that. And all it does is teach some of those people, not most, some, poor me, poor me, poor me. You know what they say in the 12-step program? Poor me, poor me, pour me another drink. That's, that's what they have learned. The more you say, poor me, the more likely you are not to become sober and happy. These are some lessons of life, the antithesis of so much of what you learn here, perhaps, and certainly the antithesis of what goes today for what is called progressivism. I want you to be good, I want you to be happy, and I want you to know how lucky you are, as I am, even after the Pittsburgh massacre. I am the luckiest Jew in Jewish history. I wrote a book on anti-Semitism. I taught Jewish history at Brooklyn College. I have been telling my fellow Jews in America, historically speaking, we are the luckiest Jews in Jewish history to live in the United States. But guess what? You're the luckiest blacks and the luckiest Hispanics and the luckiest whites and the luckiest women too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Time for Q&A. And uh, just as a reminder, if you disagree with the speaker, please come me first. Yep. If you disagree, love to hear from you. There's a, there's a mic up here, so I think you should come up. Yep. I had the privilege of meeting you one time at the Chipotle corner of Ventura and Laurel Canyon. I'll never forget it. <laughs> um, so, from my father's side, I'm Puerto Rican, Spanish, Basque, and French. 
on my mother's side, I'm Scots, Irish, English, Danish, and Dutch. When I went to the when I went to high school in the mid '90s, um, all the black kids would use all the racial expressions as a term of endearment towards the Hispanic kids. All the Hispanic kids would call all the black kids all of the racial slurs. The white people wouldn't call anybody anything, and they would call us hunky and cracker and all this stuff, and we were just like, we can't say anything. So I think this is kind of at a climax now, and um, where the, the white male is uh, the only one where you can just openly be racist against in society and on social media. Do you think it's gonna come to an end soon? Because I'm not sure if the United States United States can survive this late period that we're in. So right. either it's going to end soon or the U.S. is going to end Well, I think the, the most effective way to end it, obviously, is for people to understand the, the moral falsity at the heart of it. But also, frankly, and I haven't talked at really much politics at all, but if the Democrats who have evolved from a liberal party to a left-wing party, if they win, they will learn these tactics work. If they don't win, then they may have to rethink the division of America that uh, you're all hated by whites, you're all hated by men, patriarchy and misogyny are rampant, uh, and so on. They assume that will work, because if you could tell a black, listen, whites are racist, your only protector is the Democratic Party, if enough blacks believe that, then it's very effective. But if, if more blacks don't believe it in the next election, they may eventually have to stop this type of, of hate talk. It is hate talk, and it's falsity. Whites don't hate blacks. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a lie. This, is the, this country, I say it over and over, and uh, blacks who come from Africa, by the way, here's a statistic. If you learn this in any class here, I will put that professor on the radio make him or her famous, and give them money. <laughs> More black Africans emigrated to the United States willingly in the last 40, 50 years than came over on slave ships. This is, this, it's way more, and nobody knows this. This was reported in the New York Times in the 1970s or the 1980s. I was shocked then, and since then it's so many more that have come. Black Africans today know if you, if you want opportunity, the place is the United States of America. Because it's not a racist country. Are there any racists in it? Yes, there are racists in it. There's everything everywhere. But overwhelmingly, you know, I watch blacks and whites relate on airplanes and, on, and, and in airports and in stores and, in, and where I work. And I'm always looking for tension. I can't find any. It's the, the, the relations are so natural. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's the story. Don't let the party that divides us win. They say Trump divides us. Nobody divides us like the Democrats and the left. Nobody. And this precedes Trump. Okay. Please, who's next? Real quick, sorry. Um, limit your questions, so like the background, so we more people can answer, uh, ask questions. Yeah, by the way, just from my perspective, I don't care if you make a statement or ask a question, I just care that it's brief. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Gregor, thank you for coming. Right. Uh, my name is Bill. Uh, I've been waiting to ask this question for four years. It's kind of a softball question. Uh, you have uh, written books and traveled a lot and met tens of thousands of people. And I'm thinking of an individual who wrote a book about um, Islam history, uh, pointing out that Islam has been very violent in its beginnings and not peaceful. Uh, this is a gentleman who wrote a book, uh, this is a gentleman and his wife who were missionaries to Jerusalem in the 70s and 80s. Uh, their name was Ron and Carol Cantrell. Okay, I'll look it up. All right, thank you. Again, if you differ, try to come to the front of the line, yes. Hi, uh, so number one, I think you're nice, that's why I'm here. And uh, I'm happy and I'm a leftist, so there's that. But the real question is this, I really appreciate something you said. So, um, you know, why would women come to college campuses if they're rape cultures? Very good point. But why would conservatives come to college campuses if they're Marxist breeding grounds, you know? Like... Well, first of all, 
I know this may sound bizarre to you, but we conservatives do not consider hearing left-wing views the equivalent of being raped. And look at our friends. So, uh, it's an odd analogy, but all right. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Prager, I've been dying here in campus. First of all, I'll put the white piece too, so I represent. And I was raised Catholic in a community with a lot of Jews. Like, despite the Republican Party being the one who keeps sending all the aid and all the money to Israel, why is it that for, it seems that for every conservative Jew that I've met, like you, it seems like two dozen other liberal ones. Yeah, it's not actually two dozen, it's two. Uh, but you're right, uh, two thirds of Jews are left of center, and about a third are really leftist. I, there, uh, as a Jew who's written two books on Judaism, writing a Bible commentary right now, volume two's coming out, uh, and who's fluent in Hebrew and deeply goes to synagogue every week, I know Jewish life real well, I know Jews real well, is a very complex answer. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Jews, Jews the, the Jews who are most religious are in fact conservative. The Jews who would say uh, God is the author of the Torah, the first five books, that's what we believe uh, is, is divine, uh, or traditional Jews do, they are overwhelmingly Republican in their voting and overwhelmingly conservative in their values. The further Jews leave from, uh, from a, a, a God Torah to a man-made Bible or, and to atheism, the more they're likely to go left. So, uh, by the way, this is also true with Protestants and Catholics. The Pope of the Catholic Church is a leftist. I, I, I don't say this with any joy, I wish it weren't true. He has Catholic theology and leftist values. Uh, as I've said for years, leftism has been the most dynamic religion in the world for the last hundred years. It is a secular religion, but it is just as much a religion as Catholicism, <laughs> Protestantism, Judaism, Islam, and uh, it has influenced Judaism and Christianity far more than Judaism and Christianity have influenced the world in the last hundred years. The number of rabbis, priests, and ministers who are leftist is, is, is extraordinary. The dividing line tends to be, interestingly, divine authorship of biblical text. The people who are, mo and, and there's a very good reason for that. We believe that there is a, 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 a eternality to the text. If men wrote the Bible, men can change the Bible. If men made up religion, men can change religion. So, by the way, the same, that's, look, that's called like the living constitution, it's the living Bible. Most Jews have, have veered from those traditional beliefs, but so are most Catholics and so are most Protestants. But they're not called Catholics and Protestants, Jews are. Even a, an atheist Jew is still a Jew because Jews are a people, not just a religion. So that, in a nutshell, is what has happened. It is, a, it is painful that there were, there were synagogues that sat Shiva when Donald Trump was elected. Sat Shiva is, Shiva means seven. In Jewish life, and almost every Jew knows this, even if they're not observant, uh, in Jewish life for thousands of years, it goes back to the Bible, when an immediate relative died, you ceased doing normal activities, you sat, quote unquote, Shiva, seven. You sat for seven days and mourned the death of, of the immediate relative. To have so uh, sullied the religion as to sit Shiva because you don't like the presidential choice, this is an arrogance, the likes of which I have never seen in Jewish life in my life. And yet they were proud, uh, these, the, these non-Orthodox synagogues that did it were proud of doing it. It's a shame, there is, I think there's no future for these people. Uh, I'm, I'm, not that, I'm not knocking them out of the Jewish people, you're still a Jew, uh, even if I can't stand you. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm not the arbiter of who is a Jew. But I, I, I don't believe that there's much of a future. A child who's, uh, who grows up to see that their synagogue is really an adjunct of the Democratic Party is going to prefer to be a Democrat than a Jew. Thanks a lot. Says so most Jews my age stop practicing after a bar mitzvah. No. Yes, exactly. I know. So read my Bible commentary, and maybe it'll bring you and, and, and lapsed Christians back. Look at the reviews of the Rational Bible on Amazon. This is the biggest project of my life to show how relevant the Bible is to your life. It's called the Rational Bible. I, I really hope you'll look at it. Thank you very much. I just want to say I fundamentally disagree with a lot of things you said tonight, but I want to thank you for coming because it's always interesting to see another point of view. 
Well, I, well, let me just say this. I want to thank you for coming because you are atypical of the other side. And can you, unless this is something you're going to get into, tell me one thing you truly disagreed with. Um, the rape culture yeah. really got to me. It, it happens. No, no, wait, wait, wait. It meaning rape? Rape happens. Okay. Do you, do you agree with me that there's a difference between rape happens and rape culture? Okay, I, I, okay, fair enough, but you can't imagine how I'm curious why such a nice guy as you would have differed with me. Okay, but go ahead. I, so I wanted to know what it might be. Okay, we won't debate. Either way, and I genuinely would just like to know, did you listen to music as a kid? Like, and if so, what time? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, and you, none of you were going to like, very, maybe, well, no, it's not true, maybe 12 of you will like this. <laughs> So you have to understand, I knew at a very early age I marched to the beat of a different drummer. I really wanted to be normal, so until 13, I tried to listen to pop music, and it didn't work. Although, ironically, today, my, my second favorite music is 50s rock and roll, ironically. But it wasn't when I was a kid. But anyway, at the age of 15, my high school announced that there were free tickets to, I grew up in New York. There are free tickets to Carnegie Hall to hear a Handel concert. I never heard of Handel, I never heard of classical music, but I did no schoolwork. As I said, I was, I was very, I marched to a different drummer. I did no schoolwork. I, I was bored out of my mind at school, except uh, grammar. I loved grammar, which shows you how weird I was. And uh, anyway, I went to f ballet, I went to museums, I went to anything, I wanted to expose myself to anything, e even in high school. So I figured for one dollar I'll go to Carnegie Hall, what the hell. I took the subway from Brooklyn to Manhattan, went to Carnegie Hall, and it was love at first hearing. The next day I went back to Carnegie Hall, I spent a month's worth of lunch money on tickets. I literally missed lunch for a month, which was my whole life a good thing for me to do. And uh, I, was, I was not even born thin. And uh, so I, I, I bought tickets to, and I was in, I so fell in love with classical music. That was the only music I listened to for most of my life. I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you, I'm answering your question. Uh, I taught myself how to conduct orchestras. And I ended up conducting orchestras in the LA area, including last year at the, uh, at the um, at uh, the Walt Disney Concert Hall, where I conducted the Santa Monica Symphony Orchestra. And it was all self-taught from high school because I was bored with what was going on, but I, I, that's the music I fell in love with. I cry, I, or I, get in, I have tears at the end of Brahms' second, Mahler's uh, first, and so on. They, one of my projects in life is to bring people to classical music because I think it's a joy that a lot of people don't have that they could have. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, thoughts are, and the ideas of if thoughts and feelings don't matter, what drives action and what informs self control? Okay, what drives action and what does what to self control? What informs self control? What informs self control? I mean, how do you develop it? Yeah. Okay. Like thoughts and feelings don't matter. There, okay. So I'll tell you, I'll give you my answer to both. It's, the, it's in the introduction to my Bible commentary. The very first thing I write about is that when I was in my, my teens and early 20s, I had some rifts with my parents. Shocking, right? <laughs> and yet, from the day I left my parents' home at the age of 21, I called them every single week of my life until they died at 96 and 90, respectively. I never missed anywhere I was in the world. And there was one reason I did it when I was angry at my parents. Because I believed, I truly believed, God commanded me, honor your father and mother. That is the only reason. God, the creator of the universe, commanded me, Dennis, to call my parents. That's what I believed. If, I, if it were based on my feelings, I would have called them once a month or less. Or, or like so many adults today, not even talk to their parents. I, there's a crisis in America, the number of adult children who don't talk to parents. 
It's something I fight about on the, uh, against on the radio a lot. It's a, it's a crusade of mine to get people to talk to their parents. So that's the answer. There's a very big difference in life if you rely on your feelings you think God told you to be good. It's a big difference. It's all the difference in the world. Okay? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so this question, I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say. I'm a pre-medical student here. And here's my question for you. So you said towards the middle of your speech that um, liberals in general make people less happy or... It's Leftists, not, not liberals, yeah. Correct, I do believe that. Way. Yeah. Um, and then that the right wing or the conservative party generally makes people happier. Mm -hmm. So here's my question for you. How can you possibly say that the conservative party makes women happier when they actively try and obstruct her right to choose over what happens with her own body? Okay, so let me, let me answer that. Right. So for a woman who believes that that, is, that, is, that defines much of her happiness, clearly conservatism would make her less happy. I acknowledge that. I just, the only thing that I want, the only thing I want to address is that statement about a woman doing what she wants with her own body. And I just, only for the sake, I'm not gonna argue with you about abortion. I wanna just, if we're arguing, I only wanna argue about English. No one, no but one conservative has ever told a woman what she can or can't do with her own body because they don't believe that the baby is her body, nor does anybody else. By the way, I, I want you to know, I, I truly believe if I were an atheist, I would have given you that answer. I can't stand intellectual dishonesty. The only group I've ever heard who told women what they can do with their body was the National Organization for Women, which said that women can't get silicone breast implants. Conservatives didn't ban silicone breast implants. Uh, liberals did, because they said it was dangerous. They didn't let women decide whether they wanted implants. Turns out not to have been dangerous. The whole thing was, was another liberal hysteria. But back to my point, when you, uh, you don't have to answer me because I don't want to put you on the spot and I, I respect the fact that I have the eye of the mic and you're a questioner so I, I, I don't want to bully or anything like that. So, but I, I, I can't believe that if you know a pregnant woman and who wants her baby, that you would say to her, how's your body? You would never say, how's your body? You'd say, how's your baby? Because you don't believe the baby is her body. So what kind of moral compass is it? If I want it, then it's not my body. If I don't want it, it is my body. That, that's, it's incoherent. It is morally and intellectually incoherent. address the first thing you said about, I've never heard of conservative telling a woman what she can and can't do with her body. Their legislation does. And across the country, Planned Parenthood clinics are being defunded. Good. Good. Right, okay. All right, you, okay. So, all right, fair enough. Listen, obviously not one word I said did you respond to. You, you're repeating your point that it's her body. The baby is not her body. I don't understand how you can intellectually argue that the, call it, forget the word baby, the human fetus, whatever you wish to call it, zygote, call it anything you want. It's not her body. It's in her body. So it is a separate organism. It's not a pimple. No one tells women what they can do with their pimples. But yes, society has always had a position on the worth of the not born fetus. I won't even say baby, I won't even say human. What, call it fetus. Does it or does it have, does it or does it not have any right to life? Your view is it has no right, does, oh, so does it have a right to life in the ninth month? Does the bacteria have a right to life? Okay, that, okay, so this is why I love these, this is very important. Your equation of the human fetus with bacteria, I will leave it at that. That is where I prefer clarity to agreement. <laughs> Yeah. One more reminder, we have about 15 minutes left, and 
um, I would like to say if you have any burning disagreement questions, you can come to the front. And what about a non-burning disagreement? <laughs> And take a couple of questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to um, address something that you said earlier, where you would never personally go out and harm you know, any of the groups that you mentioned. And of course, that's true. But um, what would you say to kind of more extremist groups who interpret the rhetoric that you share and go out and commit violence on your behalf? OK. Give me an example. Well, uh, like last year, uh, when Charlie Kirk came and spoke, there were you know, several altercations out in the plaza. And uh, just a couple days ago, there was a woman who was screaming at a black student here to go back to Africa. OK, what is, what, so what did I ever write or say that would convince somebody to say that to a black person? No, no, no. Uh, and I mean, of course, that. You've never written anything like that. Right. People interpret your rhetoric and then. Okay, what? Power. Okay, so what did I ever say that you feel a normal human being? Uh, I can't speak for the mentally disturbed. So, a non mentally disturbed person reading, I've written millions of words, I've spoken on the radio for 35 years, do, and I, I'm not putting you on the spot, but can you imagine anything that I've ever said that would lead somebody to say that? Uh, yeah, earlier when you said that. I didn't say perfectly. I said this is the least racist country in the history of multiracial countries, and by and large, blacks and whites get along great. I'm sorry, I asked such a good question you can't answer. <laughs> All right, I, I, okay. Nothing like self esteem on the left. I told you, they invented it. Yeah. By the way, for the last questionnaire, questionnaire on, on this side, I wanted to tell them that the definition of zygote embryo means unborn child. The Democratic Party doesn't want you to know that. They probably lose votes. But getting on to my question, I'm Titus McCotter, and I'm a huge fan of yours, but I have one huge disagreement, and my disagreement's so big because it's what's most important uh, in my life in America, and I think in the whole entire world. I've seen Dr. Dino number one through seven, and Dr. Dino number number four, I believe it is. You, you all can look it up tonight. It's a lot about Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler made a chart, and at the very top of the chart was the lightest skin. In the middle of the chart, he put Jews. He said the Jews are half apes. Adolf Hitler put the darker skin at the very bottom. Now my question is, uh, he of course got his Nazi racism as a foundation of evolution, and all of evolution has to inevitably, invariably, inescapably have the lie of millions and billions of years. And many, many people believe in that because they get Genesis 1 and 2 mixed up and they say, maybe, just maybe, God does not know how to communicate. Therefore, when he said, in the beginning God created, and he talked about seven days, God doesn't know how to communicate, so maybe a day doesn't mean a single 24-hour day. So for you, or even for me, I know Hebrew a tiny bit, the word day has to mean 24 hours if it's followed by a number. Well, the first seven days Okay. By a number. All right. I don't know how this is related to anything, but no, 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 no. I'm sorry. No, no. Time's up. No, it's not. And okay. My question, wait, wait, this, yeah. this is my question. If we have a giant tree of evil and you see the evil, the branches are racism, communism, fascism, Stalinism, and these are the branches. Well, the phrase goes from Dr. Dino number four, he goes, one hack at the tree is better than a million hacks at all the branches. All right, if thank that's you. that's true, why don't we attack the okay. solution and uh, the years and All right, because that's not the enemy. The all right, okay. I believe God created the world. I believe God is the author of, the, of Genesis. I also believe that yom can be 24 hours or not 24 hours. The word for day in Hebrew, I'm fluent in Hebrew, especially biblical Hebrew. The word for day in Hebrew is, as uh, Psalms puts it, one day in your eyes is a thousand years and hours. Yom is just like if I would say in our day we have problems in America, it doesn't mean 24 hours. It could mean any number of things. Genesis 2, 1, and this is the generations of the, uh, uh, of the world. Uh, uh, as God, on the day God created it, but God created it in six days, so yet there it says day. So day can mean a whole host of things. Anyway, I don't know how it's related, but God bless you. Next. <laughs> All right, so immediately before you 
began speaking, there was a video from Hager University discussing why I left the left. And he talks about how he shouldn't have to support and how everybody, nobody should have to support things that they don't believe in for, on the basis of free speech, such as bakers baking cakes for gay marriages. But how does that differ from us as students paying just under $14,000 for you to come speak here? Well, they're not related. They're, I mean, I, I totally appreciate your question. I, I don't see how they're related. I, I don't know how your student funding works. I presume you have the, either the students agree or disagree that students will bring people uh, to speak at the campus and pay out of student funds to do that. Obviously, unless you believe that every student in here has a, 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 um, a quasi-religious left-wing orientation, in which case bringing a right-wing speaker using their money is, is, a, is a moral violation of funding, but I, I suspect from the reactions of a fair number of, the, of 1,200 or so people here, that believe it or not, though they may be hidden because they're afraid so often to speak out as conservatives, there are a lot of them here. So uh, I, I suspect the ratio of speakers left of center is, is pretty much greater than the number of conservatives brought to Colorado State. Do you think that that's a fair statement? on this campus, but what you said about student funding is interesting because the amount you were paid is just under the amount to vote on it. Right, to make, to make, it, to make it practical, so yes. you did not vote on it, Turning Point brought you here without... Well, so wait, do you... Okay, so, all right, so I would have been voted down because most of the students are on the left. Do you think that's a healthy thing for the campus? Yes. Okay. All right, and that's why I prefer clarity to agreement. By the way, I just want to say this. Uh, it, it, this is a very amazing thing. Do you know that Bernie Sanders was invited to the most right-wing Christian college in the country, Liberty University? Bernie Sanders, left-wing, at least agnostic, maybe atheist, opposes everything Liberty University stands for, and there was no issue about inviting him. Because the right wing, which is what, uh, which what David Rubin, a gay liberal, learned, is far more open-minded than the left wing. That's a fact, not an opinion. I hate to interrupt, but we only have time for three more questions on each side, so we're going to have to cut off the line. Like I said, if you disagree, skip to the front. Hi. Hello, I appreciate you coming tonight and engaging in conversation. Go First Amendment. Um, go First Amendment, uh, yes. I, Not go away, <laughs> just go. I appreciate some of the things that you brought up tonight, um, but one thing I can't get behind is your denial of rape culture. Um, I grew up in South City, St. Louis. I fell asleep to gunfire at night, every night. My dad always said, don't leave the house after 6 p.m. And even during the day, there were certain parts of town I would, I would go to just a couple blocks away from where I lived. But I left the house. And I saw things that I, my dad didn't want me to see. My, I, me and my parents had experienced things. My dad didn't want this to happen. But regardless, the, the, his reason for telling me not to go out was valid in a way, but it didn't keep me from not going out. So I'm curious as to why you think me choosing to come to college um, that disinvalidates, sorry, uh, the statistic of, of rape on, on campus. I, I, I just speak as a parent. Uh, it's inconceivable to me that if I truly believed a college was a rape culture, when I had choices of colleges that weren't rape cultures, for example, an all-girls college is not a rape culture. I went to all-girls high school, and there were plenty of issues there as well. I'll throw that at you. Were, uh, were girls raping girls? Uh, there's lots of history of abuse from faculty at girls' schools. By male faculty. Regardless, I'm talking about well, rape culture on campus. Okay, so then there's no place safe. If girls schools, girls are getting raped too uh, by faculty. Okay, so let so. Uh, what are you denying okay. that there's not a rape culture? That's on correct. I'm denying there's not a rape culture. I'll tell you what I think. Okay, well, for I'm what it's worth. Well, I've experienced what my friends have experienced. Just I, I'm right. So okay, so let me tell you my theory. Okay. It may be worthless, but here's my theory. I'll 
since I don't believe that there is a rape culture. A culture of rape means rape is accepted at a place and it is so common that you could speak of a rape culture. Otherwise, the word culture is meaningless. Of course there's rape on campus. Okay, but is it a rape culture? This is my theory. I think that, uh, that in the 60s and 70s, the, 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 the revolution, the cultural revolution that took place in the United States was dramatic. When I was at college, when I was at graduate school, because Brooklyn College where I went undergraduate wouldn't count because it was a commuter school. But at Columbia where I went to graduate school, there were girls dorms and boys dorms. The boys had to be out of the dorm by 10 o'clock at night, midnight on weekends. They could never go up to a girl's room. They could only be met downstairs. This was dismissed by the left as, as uh, coercive, as dismissive, as, uh, as um, patriarchal and all the usual terms. But I will say this, nobody ever spoke about a, a culture of rape when I went to school. I think part of it was because we had all these rules. So what the left did was the left had c created co-ed dorms, co-ed showers, co-ed bathrooms, co sex week on every campus where you could learn about sex toys and the, and the latest variations on S&M and so on. And uh, so what has happened and more important than any of that, again, this is my theory and I may be wrong. The, but this, I, this, not, this part is not my theory, this is a fact. The, the feminists, which is part of the left, told with young women, your sex drive is identical to that of a male. You can have a hookups galore and still enjoy it just like men can. Men are animals and so are you. So just be driven by your hormones like men are and things will be great. Turns out that for most women, some fine, but for many women, most, it doesn't work out great, the hookup culture. That they feel used, which in fact they were. And then what they do is they translate used into rape. Used is not rape. Used is used and rape is rape. That's why I think the term uh, has been created. I would add just that rape culture, I would simply define it as this mindset that men are able to take advantage of women when they want. I'm not referring to me. What does take advantage, wait, 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 what does take it, wait, okay, this is worthy of. I've had multiple men throw me up against the wall thinking that that was an okay way to approach me when I was sober and not in a co-ed dormitory. Right, but they, okay, so aside from being assholes, they, they in fact did nothing to you. They were, they threw you at the wall, which is disgusting. I agree. But, but it went, yes, it, well, yes, it is a mindset, right. That's not a rape mindset. It's, oh. it, no, it's a, no, it's a coercive mindset. It's a dis did he rape you? Did he try to rape you? I'm a big girl. Okay, <laughs> so if you were shorter, he would have raped you? Possibly. Okay, yeah. all right, okay. So all right. look, well, I'll have to leave it at that. Fair enough. I told you why I think the term came about. I think that there was a lot of sex that women regret having had, and that is now defined. In fact, Ms. Magazine defined it. Ms. Magazine said rape is any sex a woman regrets the next morning having had. It's actually in Ms. Magazine. Okay. Thank you for being here, Dennis. My name is Aiden Duncan, and my question is, after seeing people, uh, prominent Democrats like Hillary Clinton say that it's uh, not always necessary to be civil, or saying things like Maxine Waters declare that it's okay for people to go and harass members of Trump's cabinets in public, do you think that there's a problem with institutionalized violence among the left and the, the, in the Democratic Party, and what can we do about it? Well, that, that is the irony. We, we, where, where are the left, where are the right wingers going to le, uh, Democratic politicians' homes and, and where they eat and screaming at them and cursing them? Did you see the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, actually quite uh, liberal professor at, uh, in Oregon at, what was it called again? Um, that's got, uh, anyway, it's, a, it's Evergreen. Evergreen, yes, Evergreen State, thank you, and in Washington uh, State. And he, there was a day where uh, all whites were told to leave campus. The guy who's devoted his life to civil rights, to even to left-wing causes, said, I'm not gonna leave the campus because I'm white, what are you, nuts? And he is now out. There was so much violence against the guy. Uh, he, everywhere he went, he, you know, he was, his car was stopped. He was told by the school, we cannot protect you because he wouldn't leave the campus on a day where it was announced all whites should leave. And uh, he's, um, that, that's, we don't do that stuff. We don't, we don't hound. If, if anybody hounded 
the, the most, uh, the, the worst left-wing uh, politician, I would be so opposed to it, I would be embarrassed if conservatives went to a restaurant where, where, where uh, Chuck Schumer was having dinner. I, I would be embarrassed. I would condemn them on my radio show vociferously. You disgrace my cause. But they don't disgrace the left's cause. Hillary Clinton said, we'll be civil when we win, when we win back the, uh, the Congress. She just said it. That's an amazing thing, but it's not widely reported because it goes against the, the lie that we're the, we're the violent ones. Just like the lie that they're the open ones. Liberty University, remember that, Liberty University, evangelical right-wing Christian university invited Bernie Sanders. And we have people here who are against me coming to a, to a, uh, a, a public institution to lecture. Because we know, we on the right know, we can only benefit from hearing people we differ with. We may even change our mind. We're not afraid of people we differ with. The left is, and for good reason. Hi. Hello. Uh, so I have a few things um, that I want to address. Um, so I'll try to be concise if you'll do the same. So a couple times you stated um, that happiness is, um, that people are more happy on the right side of the surface side than the left side. And growing up, I've learned that people don't have sources with their facts that sometimes- Oh, I gave you the source. So every Pew poll, every, every Gallup poll, every. There is no exception to what I said. And I will come back to the campus for free if you find that what I said is not true. I, I'm not looking for what you, I know it's not true because so I'm happy. And I'm no, you don't know it's not true. But you want it to be not true. I have made you a deal. I will come back for free. I live in LA. It's a schlep to Fort Collins, okay? <laughs> I will come back at my own expense and for free if you find that polls do not show that, liberal, that conservatives are happier than liberals. Can you cite those sources? Yes, I just did Pew and Gallup. Do you want me to give you the date? Okay, hold on. You got a few minutes? It'll take a minute. Enjoy your neighbor. Want you, you, do you want me to take the time? Seriously? Okay, go ahead. So, um, the second question is, so you've stated that racism is no longer, well, do you think that racism is no longer a factor in, in the systematic form in the United States? Correct. In systematic form, it is not a problem in the United States. That is my belief. Okay. Yes. So then the Department of Justice, this is the fact, found that Ferguson, Missouri, that 67% of blacks accounted for 93% of the arrests when white people were more likely to commit crimes. That's an example of systematic racism. Okay. So how, how do you justify that? Right. Okay. So this is a very complex question. There is a there is a possibility that you may have both at work. And by the way, systemic means that the part of the systematic organization of the country is is on racist grounds. It is possible that there are more blacks proportionately in prison for violent crimes because blacks commit more violent crimes proportionately. Is that possible? Do you entertain that as a possibility? I didn't say violent crimes. You I know that. I know that. I'm starting with violent crimes. I know. I said I know. all crimes. Okay. I'm sorry. I, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have control of it. Some other people who want to ask questions, and we're already over time. All right, I feel bad. Okay, so let me, let me just say this. Okay, you have a choice in life. You know, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the United States, under Franklin Roosevelt... Out of time. <laughs> so if I'm out of time, I should leave. So what, what, what would you like After me to do? If I answer, then you're blaming me for taking time. I should be out of time. And if I don't answer, you'll say I didn't answer. It's, it's, a, it's a somewhat difficult position you put me in. I don't know what to do. Uh, I could tell you this about Ferguson, that uh, a, a black jury, largely black uh, grand jury, did, found that the officer was not guilty of racism in the killing of, was his name Michael Brown? Was that, was that his name? 
And the President Obama, on, I think truly reprehensibly, kept citing Ferguson as an example of police racism. And Colin Kaepernick wore socks at an NFL game with police painted as pigs. I think that there is uh, an, an overreach in that regard. Are there racist police? Yes, of course there are. But uh, it, we have found that black cops do not treat black suspects any differently than white cops. So you could say, well, black cops are also racist. Maybe sometimes in the complexity of life, maybe a bad, uh, a, a, a bad uh, motive is not always the only explanation. It's so ironic. When I ask people on the left, do you think people are basically good? Overwhelmingly, they say yes. And then they charge decent people with racism, misogyny, and all these other things. There are bad cops. There are bad blacks. There are bad whites. The, what America has achieved is, in goodness is infinitely greater than its flaws. That's the point that I wish to make. There are flaws that may be an example of it. But the, the large picture of the United States is what that French woman told me of a particularly friendly and decent country. And the, my biggest argument in my happiness book about happiness is that the mother of happiness is gratitude. And I think the left teaches people how to be ungrateful. And that's what makes them unhappy. Hi. Hey, hello. My hello. Name is Genesis. Hi. And I think the issue that lies with most people, or at least for me, is that all this thinking is really blocking perspective and actually seeing what is actually going on. You won't care to think about stepping in other people's shoes, such as women who birth children who are, like, children are a part of us, and also to people who are, I'm sorry. Okay, people who are oppressed mm -hmm. and and our institutionalized, it, like, I'm sorry, you got who control. face institutionalized, you got institutionalized racism and such systemic things, such as racism. You guys don't see it because you're not in our shoes. You won't Go care on. to because of things like this. You think about things that don't happen to you. I know, I understand your guys' like progressive thinking and whatever, but progressive thinking does not, and it should not try to put down or not care about or think about anybody else except for yourselves, because that's what you guys are doing. You guys won't care to look. Let me ask you a question. This is not an argument, I, I, I promise. Do you, this is truly my curiosity, do you think that the average white in America wants, you, wants good for you or bad for you? I don't know, because not everybody's the same. I know that, I said average. Not everybody's the same. What is average? What is average like, is, all okay. Are okay, do you think, so do you think more than 50% of whites wish you ill or wish you good? I don't know. You don't know? No, I don't. Okay, I feel for you. I really do. Because I think it is a tragedy that you are walking through life thinking that white people have it in for you. I said white people, though. Okay, non-blacks. I never said white people. Okay, who are you referring to? I don't Okay. No, 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 I thought you did. You said that if you're not black, you can't walk in a black person's shoe. So I'm not black. So I'm asking you what you think. That's all. I'm not, I promise I'm not arguing. Okay, I didn't say all okay. black people, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's dominantly white. Right. Like, so, the, so most whites do not wish you well. That is your belief. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. I, That's all I wanted to know. So I can only say I, it, it breaks my heart. I'm not arguing with you, Nothing. it breaks my heart that you think that. I know that it isn't true. And uh, just as you, I can't be a black, you can't be a white, I don't know any whites who wish black people ill. Not one. I am, I am not a young man. I don't know any. I don't know where they are. You know, by the way, I know, see, in, in one little teeny weensy way, I can relate because I'm a Jew, and a Jew is a minority too in America. And when I have said my whole life, this is the least anti-Semitic country Jews have lived in, leftist Jews got angry at me. What are you talking about? You know, you know how many Christians are anti-Semitic here? You know how many, you know, Catholic kids would beat me up on my way to school? 
uh, you grew up in New York, but if you'd have grown up as a Jew in Mississippi, you'd have seen how much anti-Semitism. I got the same lines, how anti-Semitic America is. So I, I, I know, so, but I'm a Jew, so they, there's not much they could argue. Well, I'm a New York Jew, so that ends all credibility because there's so many Jews in New York, I guess. But nevertheless, I, I have had my father, I guess, is it time to end? Because I, I have a sweet thing to end with. But okay, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm here for, hey, I can stay here all night. I'm fine. But, but we're not allowed because the, the, they'll be, you'll be charged more, and I will be the cause of that. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Dennis. The uh, well, I, ha I mean, I, I, I have an answer. I mean, for traditional American values, for traditional Judeo-Christian values to prevail, that's the only thing that'll do it. Where where people do not, for example, and this will bother some here, obviously, w to to have an America where race doesn't mean a damn thing, because that's what I believe. I. See, this is the irony. I grew up a liberal, which is redundant because I was a Jew in New York. But nevertheless, <laughs> I grew up a liberal. And the, the essence of the liberal view of race was integration. And race doesn't mean anything. There's only one race, the human race. That was the central liberal tenet on race. The University of California has issued a list of racist microaggression statements. One of them is, there's only one race, the human race. <laughs> So the liberal, the basic liberal tenet that I grew up with is now considered racist. Liberalism believed in integration. Leftism believes in segregation. A black dorm is a terrible thing in my opinion, terrible. Just un-American, un unhuman, bad. I don't know, I don't know what adjective to use. It's the antithesis of the American ideal. Your color means nothing, nothing. I don't respect race. I, the Nazis respect race. I'll use the Nazi word for the first time tonight. Nazis respected race. The left respects race. But I'm not saying they have anything in common. I'm just noting that they have that in common. I'm not being sarcastic. They have that in common. It's a disgusting belief that you honor race. It's unhuman. I believe deeply in the God of the Bible who created Adam, and I was taught in first grade in yeshiva, why did God create one person to begin all of humanity? So no one could say, my stock, my race is more important than yours. We all come from Adam. We are all in God's image. God is not black, God is not white, and that is all that matters. That's what I stand